me, the best part of my Real Vision journey has been the chance to refine my own investment framework through a series of conversations with brilliant investors in every corner of the globe. In this series, I want to try and continue my education by digging deeper into the lives and careers of my guests to try and learn how they think. I want to understand the experiences that have shaped them, the failures they've bounced back from, and the lessons that those failures have taught them. And I want to break down their success to find out what sets them apart. I'm not looking for trade ideas or guesses about an unknowable future, but rather knowledge accumulated over the course of careers to try and make me a better investor. And I want to share those conversations with you. Investing savings is an exercise in trust. We pick managers we believe will maximize our returns, and then we trust them to make decisions on our behalf that can change the course of our lives. The relationship between a wealth manager and his or her client is the very bedrock of the investment industry, but over the years that relationship has changed as markets have moved from the analog world to the digital. With such a crucial relationship being so dependent upon trust between the two sides, and with one side, the manager, necessarily having a big advantage in terms of understanding and experience, it seems dangerous to allow the communication between the two to diminish. That, however, is exactly what has happened as investing becomes increasingly more skewed towards passive and the reduction of fees, and traditional wealth managers are crowded out by machines. Today, I'm traveling to Bellevue, Washington to talk with a dear friend about the importance of this shift to both sides and to try and understand not only what the new landscape looks like, but also how each of the parties involved can better deal with the transition. So please join me for a conversation with David Hay. David. Thank you right. so much uh, for, for having us out here. There's, there's a lot of stuff I want to talk to you about today, and it's a conversation that you and I have had in private many, many times, and it always gets me thinking, and I always think to myself, you know what? This is a conversation that a lot of people should be having, so, so thanks, for, thanks for having us. That's a privilege, and I want to explain about my voice. Do you remember the old Robin Hood movie with Errol Flynn, one of the classics? So I'm Friar Tuck, that's me. Friar Tuck. E Eugene Pallet. I've got the Eugene Pallet voice today. Well, hopefully, hopefully we can, the people can understand what you're saying. We, maybe we'll subtitle it for, for anyone that's <laughs> there struggling. There subtitles. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, the, the, what I want to talk to you about is, is, um, is managing money and, and specifically uh, the relationship and the dynamic between um, investors and managers because it's something that's at the very heart of finance. It's, a, it's something that's at the very heart of everybody's personal decisions. And it's a dynamic that's constantly shifting um, and it seems to me, and it's felt to me over the last several years, that it's shifting for the first time, I can remember, in, in a very secular way. It seems to be moving to be much more challenging. So, you know, we'll talk about the current environment and the challenges that, that a manager like you faces uh, a little later, but I want to start with, with your beginnings in the industry. Not so much yours, because people have seen you on Real Vision before and they kind of know your story, but, but let's go back and talk about the wealth management industry some 40-odd years ago, if we can. Sure. It was totally different, as you know. I mean, the index funds were almost a non-event. Uh, and brokers were the dominant force in the investment world, commission-based, you know, not fee-based. So that was the first big paradigm shift away from commissions to fees. And that uh, maybe that was the precursor to eventually going to passive. Maybe not. I mean, that's, that's a whole different story. But certainly the client advisor relationship, I think, was much tighter back then. Yeah. And the reason is, if you think about it, with the, the brokerage model, every trade involved a conversation. You know, you don't have conversations with your clients, except maybe, you know, a quarterly or yearly review. So there's not nearly the dialogue that there used to be. And that's good in some ways. It certainly makes you more efficient as a money manager. But then I do think the client loses the allegiance, the yeah. fidelity to the, to the advisor. So that's, I think, a really huge change that's happened. But, but when, you, when you came into the business, you know, you're a young guy. Um, 
Yeah, how did you, what was your introduction to the business? What were the kind of early lessons that you were taught by the mentors or the, or the peers that you had around you? Or the tour mentors. The tour mentors, yeah, exactly right. I had one of those. There was a guy named Leroy Gross, long gone, and he was from Reynolds Securities. I was with Dean Witter, they just merged with Reynolds, and he was like their number one producer. And I mean, he was your classic Southern, good sell, you know, Bibles door to door. And he uh, got us up in, on stage in front of our training class and had us do our pitch to him. And I was terrified because he just, he looked scary. And, uh, you know, his whole thing was, because this was, this was late 70s, so this was a time of a lot of stress yeah. in the financial markets. Very depressed valuations, interest rates were going ballistic. So he said, but you got to be bullish on something, even if you're bearish, be bullish. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, be bullish on puts. Right. So I remember I, I did a two-pronged pitch to him. One was on General Motors puts, because that GM was going to get whacked going into a recession, and then by Philip Morris. So it was like a pair trade. He blew them both out of the water. <laughs> mostly because of my presentation, but I learned a lot from him. He was, uh, you know, I think all of us did. I mean, when we went out and had to deal with real clients, or real prospects, they seemed easy after that. Right. Well, that, you know, that time is interesting because it was a period of stress. And, and I think, you know, I've, I've long been a believer that the time you enter this business colors your perspective for your entire career. I think if you, if you enter a raging bull market, you tend to have to very quickly jump in and just go with the tide, and that, that changed your perspective. You know, very early in my career, we went through the 87 crash. So in some ways, it was the best lesson for me, and in some ways, it was the worst. So, so just talk about you know, your early, how you had to kind of develop that mindset to, to, to keep up with these guys. That's a very good point. I think that's true. I think that we are indoctrinated by that early experience. And in my case, it was interest rates exploding. Yeah. Stocks tending to be you know, on the downside. Uh, getting very, very cheap, down to seven times earnings on the S&P by the early 80s. So I guess I've always had a little bit of a tough time with the, the valuations that we've gotten in you know, later days, where they're just off the charts, valuations we've never seen before, really, abroad mar across the broad yeah. market. So I think that's very true. I think that's something we all have to guard against, for sure. And what were the conversations like with, with clients back then? Because I presume there was a lot of fear and you know, as, as a manager, you kind of, that's your worst enemy. You don't want people, either customers or yourself, making emotional decisions. You've got to try and keep calm about this. Ha, ha, what were the conversation, what was the dynamic between the manager and the client back then? Well, there was just no confidence in the stock market for years. It was a little easier to get people to buy yield instruments because yeah. they were very high. But even there, they wanted to buy one year. I mean, the risk aversion from, say, 79 to 82 to mid-82, was unbelievable, just come, you know, mirror or the 180 uh, version of today, you know, where risk tolerance is so high. Yeah. So back then it was all about, you know, let's just, you know, get a, get a return that's better than inflation and forget the stock market. You know, why would I buy stocks when I can get a 14% CD? Sure. So that's, uh, that was really, I mean, it was very, very difficult to get people to think about stocks at that time. But, but you, but at the same time, you've got to, you're, it's commission based. So, so there's this, massive incentive to get people to do something, right? It's well, I use a different approach, maybe, uh, maybe crazy, maybe it, you know, it worked out in the long term, but just or my idea was to gather assets. So it was much easier to get people to put money into money funds or CDs, and the, the firm I was with was paying us $50 per new account. Right. Didn't matter what kind of new account. Now, later they changed that, but I was opening 40 to 50 new accounts a month, and back then I felt you know, on top of the world. Yeah. Was, uh, but anyway, so, but once August of 82 came along and interest rates crested and started falling and the market took off, you know, one of the epic bottoms of all time, then gradually people were willing to move out of uh, money markets and CDs into equities, but it was a long, slow process. Sure. But do, but do you remember you know, that, that shift and the change in investor sentiment? Were you beating the drum trying to say, look, it's time, it, we, you've got to reverse your thinking, you've got to now believe in a bullish story, or were the investors coming to you and saying, hey, everything's going up and we're still being cautious? You know, wh from which side did the pushing come? From our side, because uh, it was, again, people have been so scarred. You have to realize the stock market from 1966 to 1982 had done nothing. Yeah. So people, in, you know, net of inflation was a loser. So investors were extremely bearish on stocks. 
which, you know, should have been one of the great buy signals of all time. So that was, no, it's not, definitely not being client initiated. Uh, but what I, my first thing was when Volcker got in and he started to get interest rates so high relative to inflation, I finally became a believer that it was time to extend duration, you know, buy longer term issues, which wasn't easy. We had an inverted yield curve and people would say, well, why do I want to take only 15%, only 15% right. <laughs> for five years when I can get 20% for a year? Yeah. I mean, that's how high, I mean, literally short one year CDs, six, six to 12 month CDs, were at 20%. Not easy to get people to come out of that. As a manager, you, nine times out of 10, you have a, more experience and more understanding of, of markets and how they work. And hopefully through the conversation you've had, what that customer needs and what his aims and his goals are. You know, that's the whole point of the, of the industry. But you're always fighting the fact that generally retail investors are, and have been proven to be over the cycle every time, wrong at both ends of, of the moves. So, so how, do you, how do you go about managing it? Because I, I, it seems to me, and we'll get to the parallels with today shortly when it's the same dynamic, but in completely other direction. Is it easy to convince people that something has changed, it's gonna go up? Because obviously there's a benefit in that to them. If you can convince them it's going up, they can start doing the numbers in their head and think about the upside. It's different on the way down. Was it easier back then to, to, to navigate that turn? Not initially. No, it took a while. <clears throat> it took years of the, the market moving up. I mean, let's say by 84, people were somewhat receptive. Uh, and then we had the, you know, the three glorious le years leading up to October of 87. And then, of course, the market gets crushed. People go, oh, my God, this is what I was always afraid of. Right, right. Get me out. I told you. Crazy idea. And, you know, we, in reality, at the time, the equities were a very small percentage of my business. But still, people were terrified. Absolutely terrified. So, you know, just when they started to get a little hope, then it was crushed. Well, well let's talk about 87 because it's, 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 a, it's a perfect example of what can happen and, and something that in that really important relationship jumps in and causes the kind of friction in, in both directions that is, can be very detrimental to that relationship. How, how did you navigate 87 with, with your customers? Well, again, we didn't have a lot of exposure, so it wasn't like people were losing large amounts of money, but it did create a state of paralysis. Uh, they were, you know, and the clients were, 90% 90, 90 of the clients were unwilling to step up and buy at that point. So it was, uh, it was another great buying opportunity that was wasted. For those of us who didn't live through it, it's hard to imagine the world in which David started his career. A stock market which had gone nowhere for 16 years and 20% interest rates is a world away from where we now stand. But taking time to try and understand the mindset of both managers and clients from days which seem a world away is, I think, an extremely important exercise as we stare at what is beginning to look like an increasingly tired and recently crash-prone bull market. But, but how, how do you go about trying to convince people? Because, I mean, if, if, you, if you were in the market, it felt like the end of the world. If you were out, you know, it's hard sitting here today with the benefit of recent history to understand there was no buy the dip back then. This wasn't a dip, this was buy the crater. How did you, how did you attempt to get people into the mindset that, hey, look, this is, this is something worth buying? Well, it was a, kind of a losing battle, frankly. Uh, you know, it was interestingly, if you think back to that time, it was the first Fed put. Yeah. And I don't think people quite appreciated what Greenspan was doing as far as the liquidity that he injected to stabilize the market. And I probably wasn't aware enough to say, hey, people, look, I mean, the Fed's got your back. It's time to, time to buy. Uh, there was a lot of fears at the time that it was like 1929. You know, it was yep. like a crash. And the really bad year was going to be 1988. 1988 was going to be like 1930. And so that had a lot of people frozen in place. And then what's interesting, too, is that when it happened, when the crash happened, the economy was very strong. Yeah. You know, running like five to six percent real GDP, much stronger than we have right now, and yet the market crashed, which is kind of a good lesson for us today, because we hear the talking heads on CNBC saying, "Oh, the unemployment's very low, earnings are very strong, economy's doing well. You can't have a bad market." Yeah. Well, under the, under the right or wrong circumstances, you can. Well, I think many of those talking heads were around in '87. I mean, there's, there's not that many people around now who 
were there and have seen it. I mean, there, right. are, there are a lot of people that didn't see 08. You know, it's, it's kind of frightening, really. I think today there's much more willingness to buy the dip, even on the part of retail investors. I think even if you had a crash today, people would say, let's buy, which may be scary. But uh, back then, again, you'd had so few good years and so many bad years that it was kind of like con confirming their worst fears of the market. Yeah. So, so what does it take to break that psychology in either direction? What, what, is it just time? I, I think time. It's just time. I think once enough time goes by. So in the 90s, by, certainly by the 1990s, during that bull market, by the end of the 90s, people had lost all fear of downside. Yeah. I mean, at that point, by you know, the 96, 97, 98, 99, I mean, obviously the Asian crisis, which did create a little bit of consternation, but the market came right back. So people were very much in the greed versus fear mode by the late 90s. In fact, extreme, extreme greed at that point. But that, you know, that, that's interesting because obviously the, the, the fear, the, the FOMO, the fear of missing out there was very slow burning. Um, to your point, you know, it, took, it took several years for people to start to get that equity bug. Once they kind of caught it in the 90s, uh, you know, we had deregulation, we had the big bang in the UK, we had the, the separation, and it, it, it felt like equities were the thing to buy. As a manager then, how did those conversations with clients change during those years? Because suddenly you've got the opposite problem. Absolutely. It was like nothing I'd ever experienced. You know, I'd hear, heard stories about the late 60s where there was a little bit of that, you know, with the Tronic stocks, and the big, uh, the big uh, cry at the time was, get me a kid. Right. It'll give me a young broker who doesn't know all this history, but he knows tech, supposedly. So we were back to that kind of an era. And for me, it was not good because, again, I'm, I'd been programmed, to your earlier point, by risk aversion, by realizing how quickly markets can turn down, by being skeptical of crowd belief, either very bullish or very bearish. So for me, it was a nightmare, frankly, and trying to tell people that this is a bubble and I started warning people when the NASDAQ was 2,500 that it was crazy, and it went to 5,000. Yeah. So off by 100%. Uh, and it lasted for a couple of years. Now, what did happen that was a bit of a savior, I think we've talked about this before, was the Asian crisis. Yeah. It did crush tech stocks horribly, and it gave us a chance to buy companies like Qualcomm that then in 99 went up, you know, like 1,500%. And that really saved my business. You know, if it wasn't for the Asian crisis, uh, you know, maybe I'd be doing something else. Well, a bit, but that, you'd be that's talking to somebody else. Yeah, you'd definitely be talking to somebody else. <clears throat> but that's that's interesting to me because that um, that understanding that to my first point about retail investors, the understanding they have, and, and this relationship, because it is a relationship between a money manager and a customer. As you said, it, it used to be much firmer, much more solid, uh, much more regular. And even back then when the markets are going crazy, how did those conversations go with, with your customers? Because you're trying to do the right thing for them as a fiduciary. And obviously, you, we, we can all be wrong, but you do what you believe is the right thing to do. But when it doesn't work out, obviously, there's hell to pay. Yeah, it was, it was a very painful period. Even though we were making money, but realize the NASDAQ was up 80% yeah. in 1999. <laughs> this is what I call the floating benchmark syndrome. I think it's very important to understand with client psychology, I mean, and I'm not kidding, I've seen it in play so many times, that they have a tendency to shift, no matter what they say when they meet with you to set up the account and their objectives, but when something's really rolling, all of a sudden that becomes like, well, that's my new benchmark, that's where we should be. Yeah. Now maybe they realize, not 100%, but it should be a big part of their portfolio. And then when the market's falling, they go, and I can't tell you how many times I've heard this, the benchmark becomes cash. I could have made more if I'd just been in cash. Yeah. So it's a real problem. It's that client, and humans are like snowflakes. They're very different. There are some people that don't think that way, that take the long-term view. They don't check their statement all the time. I mean, really the ones, you can almost know, if somebody is gonna look at their account online every day, they're gonna be a terrible client. And there are a lot of those. Yeah. That's been one of the downsides of this, all this information that you can get all the time. So it's, it's a huge problem. Uh, if you've been through cycles with clients, it's a lot easier. So if, if a client didn't fire you, let's say in the late 90s, then by the housing bubble, they go, oh yeah, that's right, you were talking about the tech bubble, now you're saying the housing bubble. Okay, yeah, I remember. You were right, you're probably gonna be right again. If, you, if they didn't, then they're still very skeptical. 
Um, I think the, the thing that's most prominent in people's minds, because they don't understand our industry, are the returns. Yeah. You know, you can talk about price to sales ratios and the, the, the Schiller PE and, you know, market cap to GDP, all that stuff. But really, they don't understand that. What they understand is, am I making money? Am I keeping, in a good market, am I keeping up with the S&P or am I not? And that's really what it boils down to. And it's unfortunate because then what it creates is a constant performance chasing syndrome. So you know, 401ks are the classic example. Yeah. They look at their 401k, okay, this fund has done really poorly for three years, this one's done great, I move it to the, the star performer out of the dog. Usually that's a terrible thing to do. So that, you know, we're constantly battling that type of thing. So I think the only way you can do it, especially with newer clients that haven't gone through the prior cycles, is with a tremendous amount of communication. Yeah. And then what you need to have, and this is very relevant to today, is time to be your friend. And what I mean by that, let me give you a classic example. So late last year, you and I were both very negative on Bitcoin. And I wrote, uh, one of our, we write a newsletter, the Every Virtual, Virtual Advisor. It was the first of our Bubble Watch EBA series. And we thought, now this has just gotten to the point, now I'm just gonna go out there to the world and say, this is a bubble. And this is the signature bubble within the overall bubble, Bitcoin and all the cryptos. And people would call, it was like the late 90s all over again. And our clients usually don't call us because we're you know, fee-based registered investment advisors. We were getting calls on below, you know, even from some very conservative clients. Well, how about if I just put 50 grand in? Right, right. And I said, look, and this is when it was about 10,000. I said, it is a bubble. Now, I, it, could, it probably will go higher. It's got a lot of momentum. My point is it went from 10,000 to 20. So kind of like NASDAQ yep, all over again, exactly it doubled right after the I chance, said it. The charts set perfectly on top of you. I got zero criticism. Why? Because within a matter of weeks, and certainly months, it was back at 6,000. Yeah. So those you can deal with, those you know, that go up like this and come down like this, you can deal. But here today, we are dealing with, in our view, my view, the biggest bubble ever. And a lot of people challenge that because we've had some whoppers. But again, I put Bitcoin under that category of bubble 3.0. That, you know, as you know, that exceeded the tulip mania. Now I'd say, well, that's kind of a niche thing, but a lot of people got uh, caught up in that. So that's one part of it. But beyond the biggest bubble ever, it's also been the longest bubble ever. Mm -hmm. And this is what I think is so crucial. Even the late 90s was not this long. Even the late 20s was not this long. So what happens is the normal investor goes, God, I'm just making you know, money year after year after year in the S&P. It never goes down. You know, one thing I never read anybody else, anywhere else, I'll mention this, you, know, you hear the big argument about is this the longest bull market ever? There's a lot of debate about that. But what's not debatable is if the market closes up for the year, which it may not, and we're going through some interesting times now, but if yeah. it does, this will be the first time the market's gone up for 10 consecutive years. Unprecedented you know, through two very different administrations. So people look at that and they go, huh, you know, you got it, it's an, it, it, we are great again. Uh, you know, we've got these new policies that are, you know, working and earnings are strong. So yeah, it's, this can keep going on and on. I, you know, one guy that's a very successful person, he thinks it's gonna go another 10 years. So it'd be a 20 year bull market. Right. Uh, you know, so when you hear that kind of talk, frankly, it makes me very nervous. But my really overarching point here is the length of time is the big problem. When it goes on for years, clients, they just kind of get numb, they turn, tune you out. Yeah. So I think that's been, if you're a rational investor, that's been our biggest enemy lately. But, so, but how do you position yourself? Because re realistically, in times like this, what you have to do is position yourself as that voice of caution. You, know, you might believe that the market has further to run, but you know as a professional in this business, and, you've, and certainly one with your tenure, you know how this ends ultimately. We don't know when, obviously, but we know how it ends. So you have to somehow position yourself as that voice of caution. You, you can either choose to be a cheerleader, which is really not a fiduciary role. How do you, do? you once said to me something that years ago, we were just sitting having a drink and you, and you, you said to me, you know, I'd, I'd rather lose a client than money. Right. And that's always stuck with me because that at the bottom of this should be what it's all about. So how do you mentally and, and, and physically put yourself in that position. Well, another little sound bite that's very true. I, uh, this is from John Hussman. You really have a choice to make in our business. When you get to these kind of extreme circumstances, you can either be 
you can look like an idiot before the bubble bursts or look like an idiot after the bubble bursts. <laughs> right. And I've always chosen to look like one before. Right. But again, I mean, it's one thing if it's a year or two, you can kind of power through that. But when it's four or five years, so that's a good lead into 2014, 2015, which I think played a very big role in this longest bubble ever because valuations were already very, very stretched at that point. And QE was being, was stopping. Mm -hmm. And the Fed was making their very tentative steps to actually raising interest rates. But more than that, again, valuations very high, credit spreads were really low. And we also, profit margins were very high. That's not a good combination no. because those are gonna change. And we saw that coming. Profit margins did indeed fall. We had a six quarter profit recession. Credit spreads erupted in two, from mid 2014 to early 2016. And yet over that period, the market went up. Now under the surface, tremendous amount of damage done. I mean, obviously energy, but you know, mm -hmm. gold, you know, kind of any hard asset, but a lot of areas really got hit hard. Uh, you know, Buffett was down in double digits. Most of the top portfolio managers really struggled that year, but you had a limited number, you know, the fangs, whatever, had a yep. good, good 2015. And so the market finished up one, but again, it was a, it was a tough year, but maybe because there was enough damage below the surface, it kind of gave the, the bull market a little bit more impetus. There was a little bit of a reset. Seeking to understand what's happening beneath the market surface is the very essence of active management. It's what separates the professional manager from the retail investor. And it's the answer to the question, why do I pay fees when I can invest in passive instruments and save myself a few basis points? Never is that more vital than at key market inflection points, which of course is precisely when the maximum number of retail investors need experienced counsel more than ever, but when they are least receptive to the message. I want to take you back to 08 and let's talk about that relationship and those conversations you had. I mean, for you, I know from 2006 onwards, I know, you, I know the conversations you were having from your side. I'm interested to hear how those words of caution were received and then coming into 08, how the dynamic between you and customers changed. So let's say summer of 07, I actually wrote a newsletter saying I thought there would be a recession in 08. A lot of, a lot of pushback, a lot of like, oh, you're way too alarmist. And our you know, thing was derivatives and leverage and housing that it just looked very precarious. And as it turned out, we were not negative enough. Right. Uh, but again, people were not really receptive to hearing even our message back in 07. By 08, the end of 08, early 09, it was terror like I've never seen. You could not reason with people. They were losing so much money so fast. I remember one client saying, if I keep losing at this rate, this was like January of 09, I'll be out of money by the end of the year, exactly. And it was, I mean, people that normally would be buyers in a weak market, they were like, I, 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 wanna, I just wanna stop the bleeding. This is about survival. The only way, frankly, we dealt with it is because the yield securities, you know, preferred stocks, uh, midstream pipelines, corporate bonds, high yield, high yield bonds were yielding like 23%. Mm -hmm. They were way cheaper than the stock market was. The stock market was kind of a, I mean, it was undervalued, but not, as you've seen, it wasn't 1982 undervalued, 1974 undervalued, not even close. But the, the yield markets, the corporate yield markets were 1932. Right. So what saved us was for the people that would listen to it, and most of them would, would say, well, so what are you going to do? You're going to sell your stocks at a terribly low time. You're going to go to cash, which pays nothing. How about, I mean, do you really think Comcast is going out of business? No, I don't think Comcast. Why don't we buy the Comcast preferred that's down 40% yielding 13%? You can get 13% and as long as they stay in bit. So that was the, the conversation that we had. And it was like, and if those companies fail, it's not gonna matter where your money is. Right, but, but, you, but again, this comes back to your first point about, about communication and having those conversations with people you know, at, at a time where it's tough to get them to stop for a second and, and listen to a lengthy explanation, they just want out. It's like, right, sell everything and then we'll have the conversation. Right. So you know, how do you go about kind of sh shaking them by the shoulder and saying, look, just listen to me for a second? Well, there are people that won't. I mean, I've seen that so many times, you know, the look in the eyes, it's just like sheer terror. And when people are in a sheer terror mode, you really have no hope. Yeah. Most people don't get quite that bad. Most people are actually looking for guidance at a time like that. So if you can pre present a credible case, and say, this is a way that you can reduce your risk because you're going from stocks to something less risky, but still have 
huge returns, huge cash flow, and great recovery potential. Uh, you know, there were bonds that, like Nordstrom, Nordstrom's bonds, our local retailer, that over a year or less went up 75% in value. You know, that, and, and we did. We said those bonds will go back to par. And so, if you, I mean, it helps to have something like that, something that's really tangible. Yeah. I mean, I think that our business is very intangible. If you can give people something, especially during times of adversity, that they can really relate to, that helps a lot. Well, let, let's, let's talk, because this is, this is a perfect time to do this, because those conversations you, you have to have in the heat of the white hot furnace, right, when things are falling apart. You know, here we are now with seemingly everything is Jake, right? everything is great. The, to your point, profit margins are great. We're up, yes, we're at extended valuations. But, but talk a little bit for the people watching this who, who are investors with money managers. What conversation should they be having now? How should they be looking at this and how should they be thinking or at least beginning to, to, to make preparations for something we know is inevitable at some point. The degree of it is, is, is debatable and the timing is completely unknown. But how, if you could talk to customers now in, in the calm, what advice would you give them about how to prepare yourself mentally? Well, I would say look at your age because people forget that they're, you know, usually when they set their investment objectives, it was 10, 15 years yeah. ago and they don't change. And then as prices go up, they don't typically rebalance. So they really should have a lot less equities than they do, excuse me, currently, but that's something that just doesn't get reviewed like it should. And it's always tough when the market's rolling to get people to say, you need to take money off the table. I'll give you a tangible example. I have a good friend. She's getting divorced. Uh, she's going to get a, a sum of money that's basically all the money she's ever going to have. And she said, well, I'm going to meet with my advisors. And what should I you know, ask? Them? I said, well, find out, first of all, what's your equity allocation? Well, it turns out it's basically 90%. Right. And, and she's in her 60s. Right. And I said, well, that's way too much. She goes, yes, you know, they, they've admitted that. But it's a very major tax hit to get me down. I said, where, she said, where should I be? And I said, probably around 30%. Yeah. Uh, you know, given current market conditions, maybe 40 normally. But, you know, the, th the tax hit. So this is where it also gets to be kind of insidious. You know, in other countries, you don't have to deal with that. Yeah. But in this country, it's very expensive to take capital gains. So people kind of get locked into it. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's a very, it's just the opposite of when people are fearful, that's tough. When people are greedy, that's tough. And lately, there's been a lot more greed than fear. Which is tougher as a, as a manager? Well, again, I think it's the time frame. If, if you went into a bear market that lasted for years and years and years, that would be brutal. I mean, at some point, people just would quit listening to you saying, you know, we should be investing. Uh, and, uh, conversely, this one that's gone for so long on the upside, uh, that's just as, as difficult. I, I think that the difference is with the way humans are wired, fear is more intense than greed. And I think that's why when you get into bear markets, they typically happen a lot faster. Yes. You know, mar bull markets are kind of like this, bear markets often are like that. Well, I've, I mean, I've always labored under the assumption that you know, not everybody is greedy, but everybody's afraid. So that's, that has always been what I figured was, the, was why these were sharper. Right, that's true. But, but also, you know, this, 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 the managing of, of greed as an emotion, and it really is, it's one or the other, right? We never really get anything in the middle. It's, it's either greed or fear. The managing of the greed side of that coin, I think is, is way harder because to your earlier point, when, when people are fearful, they want advice, they want help, they, they, they'll turn to people and they'll say, look, help, what do I do? When it's greedy, which is, let's face it, that's where we are now, the, the FOMO, the, this, this fang-driven market, people are greedy. And, and because the leadership has been so narrow, not everybody is making these returns because they're invested in equities as opposed to right. five stocks, didn't put 90% of my assets in five stocks. So very few people are making the kind of returns that the market is showing them. So, I mean, sure. Look at the numbers on the S&P. I mean, so many stocks are down this year. NYSE composite is down, the value right. line average is down. Russell, I mean, everywhere you look. So, Russell's about flat. But, but nothing, nothing, it's only fangs that are going up. And so this, you've got this mindset that, hey, we're at all-time highs, Donald Trump's pumping the stock market, what's going on with my returns? How, how do you deal with that? Because again, it's not, it's not a difficult thing to explain if you've got the time and the space and the attention to do it, 
but it seems to me that you don't really have that in a market like this. No, and I think that, you know what relates to this is the tremendous growth of passive investing. As right. we know, lots of outflows from active, massive inflows into passive. So by definition, where is that money going to go? I mean, those things are all cap weighted, or almost all of them yeah. are. So this thing, in a way, is is kind of a you know self perpetuating machine, that as money goes in and it goes into those names, they go up, that attracts even more money, and it just keeps going and going and going. But as we know, at some point, something goes wrong that changes the narrative. And then all those very, very expensive stocks start coming down. And then the, you know, the people at that point, when it, if it's quick and it rallies, no problem. But if it's a sharper decline, and especially if it becomes more ongoing, this is where I think time plays such a big role. Then those people finally, you know, say, "I can't take this anymore." Then you get this, you know, the waterfall decline. I think that's coming. We're not there yet, but I think that's coming. But in the meantime, I mean, you try to show them, you know, all the charts and graphs, and say, "Look, look how few companies are driving this. Look back at history. That's never healthy." To take it to a different level, uh, the reality is the only stock market almost in the world that's doing well this year is the U.S. Yeah, and then within the U.S. It's a very limited number of companies that are doing well. So you've got narrow upon narrow. That's very unhealthy, like a double negative. So, so you, know, you, you pour over charts, I mean, more than just about anybody I know. And, and so, again, I want to get to this conflict between an experienced 40-year investor who's looking at so many red flags but has to weight that accordingly and still manage to his, his customer's objectives. You know, you can't say to your clients, right, everybody will get 100% cash because I'm nervous. How, in, oh, wait, wait, we don't do that, actually. No, of course not, but, but internally, how do you manage everything you see that screams caution with the fact that you have to remain invested, maybe not fully invested? But. So the way we've done it is to say that we, for the last few years, we've been at 50% of our equity target. That's the highest cash we've ever had. Now, this is where 2015 comes into play, because in 2015, there were a lot of bargains. Not so much in the U.S. stock market, the U.S. bond market, energy. There were sectors that were cheap internationally. So we did go on offense with those areas, and fortunately, that gave us a pretty decent 2016 and 17. So that helped. I mean, again, that was kind of a reset year where you could, you know, there were some bargains. Uh, but now this year, we're, it's been painful because, just like you're saying, People are looking at the S&P, which even today it's come down, but it's still plus four, plus five percent. Yep. And we're kind of hovering around break even. And we feel pretty good about that because we also have a lot of income securities, interest rates are going up, so bonds are down. I mean, almost everything in the world is down this year, yep. with the exception of uh, the S&P, NASDAQ, and junk bonds, ironically, right. which we think are going to get crushed, but uh, another story there. So, you know, we've been telling clients for years, we are going to tr do our best to make you know, some money during this crazy, unprecedented period that we've seen. But we are definitely not going to get, we're not going to match the S&P. We, we've warned them that for years. And that's helped. I mean, if you can kind of pre-warn people, that helps. But still, they get antsy. One thing that, that I've done a lot of is trying to get them to visualize what it's going to feel like when the bubble, because everybody knows it's going to end. They didn't want to say I don't know when, I said, I don't know when, but they do pretty much agree that the longer it's delayed, the worse it's going to be when yep. it happens. So I try to get them to visualize how it's going to feel the day they wake up, they see the market's been crushed, and they've got all this cash. Just think how that's going to feel. We're going to be able to buy into everybody else's panic. So a lot of visualization. And that, you know, some people that works, a lot of people that works. But the reality is, I think in our business, you got to just uh, accept the fact that 10 to 20 percent of your clients are not going to stick with you through a full cycle. Yeah, and, and you, of course you can't manage to try and keep those. I know some people do. People, people try and keep everybody happy, which is it's obviously possible. impossible. Yeah, sure. But this, and again, you, you get to that point. But visualizing holding a whole lot of cash in your hand and the market down 15 percent, and having the guts to pull the trigger and buy because obviously when it's down 15%, all the narrative is it's going down 30%. So how do you, how do you have that conversation? When do you know, okay, we should start nibbling here? Talk us through that back and forth between you and the customer. So our mantra is small correction, small buy. Big correction, big buy. So the math kind of works for us. And I think that's a very important point. It's, I mean, we are, 
we want to be on the buy side. We want to be cashed up when people are way over optimistic, only to be able to deploy it when the values reappear. And we, the great thing about the way we're positioned, we can almost go anywhere. So if it's Japan that gets crushed, or if it's emerging markets, if it's energy, uh, gold stocks lately, we actually bought gold stocks recently that were really slammed, and they've, had, they've been acting nicely lately. So you know, we, we have that ability to go where the, you know, the best values are. So that's the whole point. It doesn't make any sense to be cashed up and then just ride through the downturns, which I've seen happen to a lot of bright yeah. people. I mean, we talked about this in the past that uh, there's been some folks that have made great calls about the trouble coming, and then when it hits, and then when the prices get discounted greatly, they stay bearish. Now, the people think that we're a perma bear. You know that's not the case because you know how often we've been bullish in the past, and we've got it in our newsletters. Admittedly, last four or five years we've been, you know, other than, you know, energy and some other areas, we've been cautious. But you can't just sit with cash, you know, long term. And I, I don't think you can also call bottoms. I think the dollar cost averaging approach is the best. And also, I think it's important to have a systemized, system, systematic process of, you know, when it happens, you buy me. Right now, we have orders in place based upon how much the market comes down, that we will buy regardless. We're not going to second guess ourselves. Yep. And again, it's based upon how big is the decline. If it's a 10% decline, a little bit of buying. If it's a 15 more, 20. And what we think is going to happen is a flash crash. And we actually believe that we won't have time to go buy our normal stocks or bonds. We're going to have to use an ETF. And it's interesting that in some of these flash crashes, the market might be down 15%, but a high quality ETF will briefly be down 25. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're on the lookout for. If we can find a, a good diverse ETF that's down 25% in an hour, we will commit tens of millions of dollars to that instantly. But the, but the discipline required to do this, you know, that, that, to me, essentially, that marks the difference between professional investors and, so somebody, Lee Robinson said to me, he said, you know, the difference between, uh, Professional investors and people who do it for a hobby or just make their own money is that professional investors know how to sell better. You know, they know when to take profits, and they, and, and and that stuck with me a long time. But I think in times of panic, it's that it's that willingness to step in because you can you can see value amidst all the chaos, and you know what value is. How do you how do you maintain that discipline? Well, you know, having gone through it a bunch of times helps. Yep. Uh, we look at certain things, there are signs of capitulation, like, you know, relative strength when it collapses, it gets to levels that's consistently been a bottom. I mean, there's, there's a number of tools we can use. Everybody can use them. But the problem is that a lot of times fear overrides that. And people, and, and another thing to think about, if you're a professional investor, let's say in a fund, as opposed to at a RIA, you know, we're managing individual segregated accounts, you're probably going to hit with redemptions. Yes. So you may want to buy, but you can't buy because you're busy selling to pay. That's one of the real nasty things about mutual funds, unfortunately, uh, you know, that effect. And, and the same thing when the market's raging and you get all this money coming in, you got to buy. Yeah. Now, some of the good funds will shut their doors, but not too many do that. So we're, we're not in a position. So we are not in that position. We can buy without fears of being, having redemptions. So again, we, we're, we're not geniuses. We just believe that the more the, the market comes down, the less risk there is. Most people look at it the other way. I mean, they look at a market like the last 10 years, and they go, this is a very low risk market. It's just been so steady, so predictable. It's, it's not what it used to be. And we look at it the opposite. We think it's a very high risk market now. It was a very low risk market in early 09. Markets becoming de-risked as they fall is another mental battleground between retail and professional investors and a perspective which the active manager is constantly at pains to inculcate into their clients. But the rise of passive investing has changed not only the frequency of the dialogue between manager and client, but also the nature of those conversations. And I wanted to try and better understand the nuances of those changes from a practical standpoint. So. Passive investing, let's talk about that because it's, it's, it's such a challenge to traditional industries. And obviously, 
I think I understand how the conversations go, but, but let's talk about how passive investing has changed the course of the dialogue between you and your investors. Well, it's certainly a disintermediation type of yeah. event, right? It means that you can get rid of the, the professional. And, you know, I think for a lot of people, that's maybe okay. Uh, I think the problem is that, like any tool, it can be used or abused. And I think it, particularly in late cycle bull market, it gets, uh, gets abused. Uh, for the reasons we talked about earlier, but just the sense that as money comes flooding into a market, late in an upstage, that it just reinforces. You just buy more of what's, I mean, that's what they have to do, right? But there's no judgment. There's no saying, well, I think Amazon is ridiculously priced. I mean, if it's 10% of that ETF, you're gonna buy 10% yeah. of Amazon. So that's all well and good uh, during a bull market, but it's what happens afterwards, there's no defense. And people have forgotten about defense. So it's, you know, those things are gonna, they're gonna get 100% of the upside, 100% of the downside. I think most people would be better off getting something like 70% of the upside yeah. and 70% or hopefully less yeah. of the downside. And you can't do that with passive investing. But now you could say, well, I'm gonna do it through the asset allocation. And actually we do, we use a lot of passive ETFs in a couple of our strategies. So as long as they're used properly, uh, like large cap growth, we have been overweight large cap growth ETFs since 2004. Right. I never thought it would happen that way but they were very much out of favor back then. And you know, we have been obviously dialing back lately. So it's not to say the passive is bad. I think that's a, that's a misnomer. I think that's kind of sour grapes a little bit on the part of active yep. managers to say that. I think they definitely have a place, but they can, they can obviously be horribly misused. Uh, and I just think that when they're really popular is when things have been going up a lot. And that's probably when you should be taking profits. And when they're really unpopular, it's probably when you should be buying them. I mean, there were people did not want to buy large cap growth ETFs back in 04, 05, 06 because they'd been dogs yeah. you know, after in the wake of the tech tech bubble. So, you know, if you're in a long term investor, I don't care how you do it. I think you need to be a contrarian. Uh, now, if you're a short term investor, you can't be a contrarian. But there's but there's contrarian for contrarian's sake, and there's and there's long term contrarians who who pick their spots to actually do something about that contrarianism. I'm interested in the, you know, this conversation. It's, it's, it's the interplay between the manager and the customer that I'm really interested in. So you know, take us inside that, that conversation, which you must have had hundreds of times. Why do I need to pay you active management fees when I could get the same thing through an ETF? I mean, take us through that conversation, the dynamic in play, and, and how you deal with it, because it's... Sure. Well, I'll take you a start at the level that comes up a lot is do you hold cash in the portfolios? And we'll say, yes, at times. Why should we pay you to hold cash? And I'll say, well, because you pay us to know when to hold cash. Exactly right, yeah. And when to deploy that cash. Well, I don't want to do that. I really don't, I want to take the cash out of the portfolio. I said, well, that, that's really a, a major problem because then we have no buying power. Yeah. And so, you know, that that's kind of the first level of that. But, you know, oftentimes the best way to deal with that point is to say so, Mr. or Mrs. whomever, how have you been doing on your investment portfolio? Now, if it depends on when you're talking to them. If it's at a time like this, oh, I'm doing great. But if it's after one of the inevitable blow-ups, it's like, oh, yeah. I thought I was really smart. I was making so much money. And it's the classic, don't ever confuse brains with a bull market. Sure. And so if you get them to go back and remember prior downturns, and how well they did or how poorly they did, then you, that's when you can get the door open to say, well, that's why you need us. You need us to manage the downside risk. Because if the, the worst thing is when everything's terrible and they've taken such hits that they run, you know, they, they get out. Yeah. That is the absolute, they're, then they're just locking losses and those you can't recover from. But what I really worry about these days is people, like we were talking about earlier, I mean, the, the population is aged, the investing population is aged. We're not in our 50s anymore, we're in our 60s, 70s, yep. or even 80s. And these people have been living, I mean, interest rates have been gone for years, right? So that means the interest rate component of a portfolio has provided very little cash flow. So to get a 5% withdrawal rate, most of that's having to come out of the equity side. Yep. When the market's going up, no problem. But if you get a 30, 40% decline, 
these people, and especially as they've been skewed to the equity side, so now they're perhaps 70 or 80% equities, they get in a hole that they'll never come out of. We love Ned Davis research, and they've been pretty bullish up until lately. Uh, but one of the things they run is a household equity allocation to total future returns. They're the only ones that do this, as far as I know. And it's just remarkably accurate. So in other words, when households are very heavy on stocks, over the next 10 years, very low returns. When they're very light on stocks, very high returns. I mean, to us, that makes sense. Yep. But still, to see it statistically validated, I thought is, and I've sent that to a number of people too, but again, in a raging bull market, people put blinders on and, you know, don't confuse me with charts and yeah. even saying that and the market keeps going up and, but yes, I think it's hugely important. Well, so, so how do you, I mean, obviously to your point, you use passive, you don't want to debunk passive to people, but, but you know, when you, when you, you mentioned there, this part of the conversation, well, this is why. You, you want us, this is why you would pay us to do the job that we do. How difficult a conversation has that become? Because I, I presume, because there hasn't been a, a need for downside risk management in several years now, how tricky has that conversation become and how much pushback do you get against it? Well, again, it's difficult when you don't have any downturns. The good thing about what's happened lately is there's been enough of a decline that you can actually say to people, okay, let's let's do a snapshot of how your portfolio is done from say September 20th, which was the peak of the S&P, yeah. to October 11th, which was the trough at least for now, about a 7, 6.7, 7% drop. So if you can then show them, like on a you know one of our reports, your portfolio only dropped one one and a half percent, they go, oh, well now I get it. And if they were capturing. 60% of the upside and they only got 40% of the, you know, they get them into that, you know, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying yeah. to give you a decent amount of the upside, but very good downside protection. But to quantify it, I think is critical. And I don't think most advisors do that. When you get these, we call them stress test periods. Yeah. When you go through a stress test period, use that. Now, if you get them fully invested, that's not going to do any good, but, but no, maybe but it maybe it gives you a wake up call that perhaps this, you know, 80 year old client shouldn't be 80% in equities. What should customers what questions should should they be asking right now when they when they when they talk to their managers? What should they be asking them? What should they be looking for? Well, I would definitely be asking for some kind of an estimation of what how much downside am I exposed to? Yeah, and you know run run the scenario. There's all these softwares now that you can run real life scenarios. You can plug in. Well, what if we have another 08? What if we have another uh, you know 1974? You can plug in real past market periods, how, how does that look? And I, I think people get shocked when they see how much their portfolios can go down. The other thing that I think is really important about that, don't do it in percentage terms. Yeah. In other words, you, you might say, well, the, your portfolio can go down 40%. Now, some people will do the math and go, but when you, if it's a $2 million portfolio, you're, you're going to be down $800,000, yeah. and they'll just see the blood come out of their face. Sure. Can you handle Well, I can't handle that. Well then you can't be virtually fully invested in equities. But I love the market, it's doing great. <laughs> but if you can't handle that downside, yeah. you have no business being in there. So I, I th and then if you do get these periods where there is a little bit of a hiccup, where you can then quantify how did the, the portfolio do, and if it didn't do very well, at least if it's only down 7%, you got a chance to make an adjustment before yeah. there's too much pain. You know, this, this, this idea of in the middle of you know, what, as, to your point, it's been a raging bull market of being that voice of calm that, you know, which is, that's your job, right? That is essentially a big component of your job is to be the, the pole in the middle that never gets too bearish and never gets too bullish. Uh, managing that now, you've managed through 08, you've managed through real panic, you've managed now through a long bull market where everything's going up. We touched on this earlier, but I want to kind of dig into it more. Which is harder? Which is harder to manage over an extended period of time? Well, as you said earlier, I've been doing this almost 40 years. This has been the hardest ever, these last five years. Yeah. It should have been the greatest five years. You know, if you, it's almost like the more you know in a market like this, the worse you are. Because you've got experience, you do research, you realize how dangerous things are. and. As a result, you come to the wrong conclusions in this environment. Yeah. 
So that's very tough. And it gets back to what we were saying earlier that it, because of the intensity of fear versus greed, bear markets tend to be shorter affairs. So I think in that way, they're easier to deal with. And especially for us, because we are always well prepared for a bear market. What we're not so well prepared for is a never ending bull market. Yeah. I mean, I don't think people realize that there's never been a market like this. You can't go back and find any market that has been at alarm levels for five years, well, certainly for four, but arguably five, but for sure for four. I mean, levels where you, you look at every other long-term metric that has worked over time, the market's a sell. Yeah. And Ned Davis, which has stayed bullish through most of the last four years, they've admitted all that whole time that the valuation, valuations are extreme. But, you know, we, we know all the reasons this we've gone through. And that the only saving grace I have is I've told my clients, I've told our readers of our newsletter, nobody has ever seen this set of circumstances. So what I tell myself and I tell our team and I tell our clients is, it's a football coach who said this, keep the main thing. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. Right. And the main thing is that we are in a centrally ba central bank created bubble we don't know when it's going to end, but we know it's going to end. And the other main thing is that we can't be totally sure, but we can be pretty sure that because it's been delayed so long, it's going to be much more damaging on the downside. Just a much bigger bill to pay when the bill finally comes due. The problem is that most people don't really understand the financial markets. So their natural default is their rate of return. Yes. That's like, that's the ultimate tell. And if you're telling them, something that disagrees with the ultimate tell, that's darn tough. That's why you've got, I mean, really, we, <laughs> I think if you're gonna keep a lot of your clients at this stage, it's gonna be tremendous amounts of communication. Uh, and uh, frankly, we need a correction. Yeah. We, we really need a correction just to remind people that, oh yes, this, this, all these returns are, don't come without a cost. I, I think that America as a culture is part of the problem. It's become very. I want you know. I want my maple now. Instant gratification. Well, my maple. I want it now. Yeah. Yeah. Instant gratification. It's uh, you know we, we just are. You know, our attention spans uh, spans are so short. So that works against us as well. Uh, it's just like a, you know. And if if the fascinating thing I think about financial markets is that bad behavior is typically rewarded near term. Yes. It's so true. So you tell somebody okay, you're overexposed to equities, and you, let's say they agree and they cut back and they go from 80% to 50%, and then the market goes up the next day, and the day after that, and, they, and they're thinking, what an idiot. Right. How could, he, how could he have possibly gotten me to do that? Yeah. See it all the time. And of course, flip side, when the market's crashing, and you're saying, hey, we gotta, we gotta start investing, and they put that marginal yep. investment dollar in there, and then the next day they're down. So that immediate, you know, move, uh, action and then whatever the market does is so often contrary to what humans like. Yep. I mean, we like to be rewarded for doing the right thing or what we think is the right thing. Yeah. And when you get punished, you think, I did the wrong thing. That's a really big deal when you, when you think about how that affects investor behavior. From the retail perspective, the last few years have been some of the best ever. Yet for the professional wealth manager, the opposite has been true. And that has nothing to do with a reduction in their fees, but about an increase in the difficulty of trying to protect retail investors from themselves. Something I want to talk to you about is, is, um, is Bubble 3.0. You're trying to chronicle a bubble in real time. You're, right. you're, you're writing a chapter every you know, few every, weeks. Every month, and I think I'm going to go to every two weeks. Right. Because I think it's getting close. Yeah. And that was one of the reasons I wanted to do it, was to be out there with 10, because we had 10,000 readers, with 10,000 witnesses, that he was at the sand before it happened. Right. This is how it was going to play out. And you know, I'm not saying I have all the you know, twists and turns figured out. I don't. But just the, the general idea and, and to, to what things to look for as to when we're close. And, and a lot of those things are turning out. I mean, we are seeing it playing out right now. But you know, I know how thorough, you, I've got on planes with you before and I've seen the amount of reading material you have. I know how diligently you research this stuff. Fr from beginning to write Bubble 3.0 and the idea about, okay, I'm gonna chronicle this uh, lifetime. What's happened, well, how's, how have things changed since you began it? 
and how has your your roadmap for what Bubble 3.0 looks like been altered by the events of the last six months? It's a great question. If you go back to when I started writing it, really the only thing that had popped was Bitcoin. Everything else, I mean, there was a little bit of stress in foreign markets, but not much. When things really started to go south was in May, overseas. So that was kind of the next shooter drop. And then as we got into the summer, I mean, that's when you started to hear the horror stories about real estate. Mm -hmm. And right after Labor Day, the the numbers, as you alluded to earlier, out of New York City, I mean, they're cutting prices at a faster rate than they did during the Great Recession. Yeah. So all of a sudden, you know, it's like the, the dam is breaking. But back then, when I started, it really was just Bitcoin. Uh, there was nothing else that really uh, had had really decisively broken at that point. So, so have these changes, have they, have they shifted your view on either the speed with which this happens or the direction it takes? Well, I continue to be of the belief that it's going to be pretty speedy. I mean, I actually, one of the, at the end of our last Bubble 3.0 chapter, I made a parallel with the crash of 87 because I really do think there are eerie similarities. I mean, just for one, look at the tax cut. So in 87, yeah. the tax bill had been 86, and it was a very dramatic, very pro-business, very confidence-generating tax bill. So that's one similarity. Uh, the Fed, the Fed was hiking aggressively back in 87. The bond market was under duress. Mm -hmm. There were intense foreign uh, tensions, trade tensions. Reagan had slapped a tariff on uh, Japan, Japanese electronics. Yeah. Uh, so lots of parallel, and then also the role of computerized trading, which really never existed. Sure. So if you go through, and there, I'm just kind of hitting a few of the highlights. Some of the technical people we follow are also coming up with the same conclusion, saying, in fact, somebody just sent me a transcript of uh, Wall Street Week from October of 87, yep. Marty Swag, yep. and the stuff he was saying then, that you could absolutely do a complete replay today. Now, the odds are it won't be a crash. Or if it is, it won't be exactly like it was in 87. You know, maybe it'll be a crashette, as we call it. But still, it, it is likely to be painful. Uh, you know, I, I happen to believe if it happens, we'll probably see a, our year-end rally. I think where things really get scary is to next year. Uh, because for one thing, I, I think a recession, if you, so the, the, talk about recessions for a second. We haven't had one, it's like a bear market. Sure. Haven't had one in 10 years, one of the longest recoveries ever. I think it is actually now the longest recovery and expansion ever. Uh, but if you listen to the uh, most mainstream economists, they're saying maybe 2020, maybe 2000. None of them think 2019. As you know, economists as a whole have never called one recession. Right. So the fact they're saying 2020 should tell you one thing, it's not gonna be 2020. Right. So that means either 2021 or beyond, or next year. Yeah. Now, what's fascinating is if you look at a lot of the data, LEIs, uh, you know, state tax receipts, a lot, it doesn't look bad. But it's also fascinating to go back and look at prior recessions and watch how quickly things can go from fine to panic. Sure. It, they just go like that. Once it changes, it changes overnight. Our mutual friend, Daniel DiMartino Booth, has done some good work on this recently. So I. Yeah, I think that would be a huge shock to people. I mean, most people think next year is going to be a good year. Certainly, earning, you know what earnings estimates are now? Five-year five earnings estimates. Yeah, they're crazy. 16.5% yeah. compound rate for the next three to five years. You know, it hasn't been that euphoric since the late 90s. Well, and yet, and you have GMO coming out with their, their estimate for, you know, 5.7% negative returns over the next 10 years compounding. So it's just something's got to give somewhere. Something's got to give. Yeah, this 87 thing interests me because an 87 style crash, which was really like a bad week in the markets. I mean, it happened so fast, bounced around the bottom for a very short period of time, and then went straight up again. Right. Yeah, you know, I, I, I'd, I'd love to think that the next crash is the, is the same, right? Because that it was it was a shock, but there was there wasn't any real lasting damage done as as, as I remember, and it was. Well, that's true. It wasn't. Economy, but, did, economy did fine, 80, 89. Exactly right. Uh, did, is there a chance we, we get that lucky? Because uh, I don't well, feel like there is. I think you're making a great point. Here is what I think will be the divergence. So let's assume we do get kind of a crash at kind of scenario, you know, kind of an October 87 repeat. The assumption, the recovery, which is likely the V bottom, the assumption will be it'll be like 88 all over again. The right. market will, at 89, where the market went up the next two years. That's what people will believe about 2019. 
That's where I think the big surprise is going to be. It's not going to have that follow through. This is going to be more like the warning shot. And the real trouble is to come. So I guess to say this will be more like 1929, and I don't mean of that magnitude, 1929, 1930, rather than 1987, 1988. Yeah. And I just think there's so many, the problems are so serious. And, and it's, you know, actually maybe good to think about and talk about what will our brilliant central bankers do when we have a serious market decline. And actually, I believe Jay Powell is a good man. I think he doesn't like the Fed put thing, but I think the Fed put still exists. However, I think it's at a lot lower strike price than it was with Bernanke and Yellen. In other words, he's going to let the market fall further before he intervenes. But I also believe he'll still intervene. And the other guys, the other central bankers will too. But what will they do? You know, when you've got interest rates, I mean, the Fed can cut some. Uh, they can stop QE or QT, they can, you know, their balance sheet shrinkage. But what do these guys really do if we have another panic? I mean, I think that's a huge, huge discussion point. Yeah. David's real-time chronicling of what he calls Bubble 3.0 is a fascinating experiment and, I suspect, will turn out to be an extraordinary documentation of a seismic change in the financial tides. But if he's right, the challenges facing both professional and retail investor alike are enormous, so I wanted to get a sense of the current challenges he faces and those he sees on the horizon. Well, Dave, look, we've, we've, we've spent a lot of time talking about um, how the industry's changed, how the conversations have changed. Uh, and, and I guess what that leaves us to do is talk about the different challenges being faced, not just from the perspective of that, that client-manager relationship, but also the challenges faced by you as a, as a manager in today's markets. I mean, there's seemingly everywhere, as, as we've touched upon. So let, let's talk about some of the big challenges you've, you, you, you have actually actively managing money at the moment. Well, our biggest challenge is staying with our game plan despite the pressure to change. So what I mean is we're, we're just going to stay very cash heavy, very defensive until we have an opportunity. You know, we're not going to chase the market. We're going to let the market come to us. I know that sounds like a sound bite, but I think it's very true in this case. Uh, you know, I think it is challenging as we've talked about when it's just up, 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 up. You know, it's like it, it creates all kinds of misperceptions and unrealistic expectations. So you know, I, I think we just have to you know, walk our talk. We're, we've been very clear with people that we are not going to throw the towel in. People say, well, when are you going to get bullish? I mean, when are you going to say that you were wrong right. and, and why? Well, we're not going to say, well, I'll say we were wrong. We were certainly early, but we're not going to change until we have an opportunity. And I do believe that when that opportunity comes, given all the distortions that have occurred, and how they're now reversing, clearly reversing, uh, we'll have a heck of an opportunity. You know, for so long it was, don't fight the Fed. Yeah. When do you hear that anymore? Nobody says that because if you paid attention to that, you'd be running for the hills. I mean, this is the first, let's face it, this is the first double tightening in history where they're both raising rates and they're shrinking their balance sheet, the so-called quantitative tightening, QT. And now you'll have the other central banks uh, no longer in an offset. So we'll have gone from last year, the max QE, to the end of this year, zero QE, and soon negative QE or quantitative tightening. So I think that the big challenge for somebody like us is just don't cave in at the worst possible moment. Mm. Well, that, that's, again, easy, easy to say, hard to do when you're under pressure. I mean, it, it's, again, it's that difference between the retail investors the pressure is self-imposed, it's mental, and they capitulate. But for you guys, it's a very real set of conversations you have. Absolutely, because here's what happens. If you ask the average investor, what's the S&P doing? They could come pretty close. If you could ask them what bonds are doing, no idea. Or overseas markets. So you get a year like this where everything is going down except the S&P. Yeah. And it really creates distorted you know, expectations yeah. and yeah, perceptions. Good point. So, so, so where are the pressures in the market? Where, where, what are you looking for in the markets? What are the, the warning signs that you're watching to see? Well, we already talked about real estate. Yeah. I think the biggie, though, is buybacks, because as long as you've got these massive share buybacks, and this year probably will be close to a trillion, record-breaking, uh, I think as long as that's in place, the market declines will be fairly modest. 
When that'll change, I don't know. I suspect maybe next year, because I do believe share buybacks will be revealed to be, at these prices anyway, a scam. You know, what's amazing is we're probably by the end of the year, early next year, we'll have had five trillion of total share buybacks this cycle. It's five, is it? Is it five trillion. Wow. Well, it's about four and a half now, but you know, kind of should be 4.85 by the end of the quarter, end of the year too. Uh, but what's incredible is how little the share count has shrunk. It's only like six or 7%, even though the, the, the tri five trillion is about, if you do an average market cap, it's about 25% of the market. So a lot of this, most of this money that's been expended at these increasingly high prices has been really for the management for their you know, yeah. cover their to offset the, the the dilution from stock options and then as we've seen recently insiders are selling at the most intense rate they have since 2007. even if you look at sears i mean amazingly sears up until 2013 was buying back billions of stock right. they bought 6.7 billion of shares I mean, great use of shareholder money ge it hasn't gone broke won't go broke but still they were a massive share buyback machine in the 20s, and it's now 12 and change. Yeah. And that's, I'm afraid, that's what's going to happen to a lot of companies. People will look back and say, geez, you bought back billions and billions and billions, maybe tens of billions of stock, and you way overpaid. How did that help us? And then you guys were selling your shares at the same time. And I think people get very upset. And when buybacks become discredited, I think that's when you've got a major problem. That's when you're not just talking about a correction. You're talking about a real bear market. Well, yeah, we're in, we're in a quiet period now for, for earnings season. Uh, and it's interesting, to your point, that, that the weakness in the market coincides with the fact that these guys have stepped away. Correct. Um, it's, a, you know, it's a big, big tailwind for the market. You know, one, one, of the, one of the other big tailwinds obviously has been central bank policy. And the assumptions are by everybody, I think, that, that if we get a correction, that the, that is number one defense play is the Fed put. Again, we touched on that earlier. Is it still there? What, what, do you, what do you think the central banks have left and what do you think they do if we get to a point where they're called upon to act again? Well, I think that is the multi-trillion dollar question. And they don't obviously have a lot to, that they can do, in, and especially the ECB. I mean, they've bought corporate bonds, they've bought government bonds, they've driven rates to negative. Not a lot they can do. Now the Fed, obviously, they can cut and who knows where their balance sheet will be by the time the, uh, the, the you know, whatever hits the fan. So presumably they could go back to uh, doing QEs. I suspect what they will do is that they will focus on credit spreads just like the ECB did. They don't like to do anything for the first time. I've been saying this for a few years and people misunderstood what I said. I said, in the next crisis, I think the Fed will target credit spreads, shrink that cap back down. Uh, but there hasn't been a crisis, obviously. No. So it hasn't been tested. But again, the ECB did it. And let's just say that we get you know, some kind of bear market panic and the credit spreads blow out. Because right now they're tight, but they're widening. In fact, triple B spreads are widening quite clearly. Junk bond spreads have just started to, to turn up. So if things get really out there, I think that's where the Fed will focus their firepower. And you know, Jay Powell, I mean, obviously he's, he's a different animal altogether to Bernanke and Yellow. So it certainly seems to be now in the kind of eye of the storm. Is he just another from the cookie cutter mold of central banks we've had since, uh, since Greenspan or is he different? I think he's different. Uh, he's, he's not an academic and he came out of the private sector. Uh, he was on record in the Fed minutes as opposing QE3. I read that, yeah. Uh, but he went along with it anyway. So I think he's, I think he's gonna be a great Fed chairman if he doesn't get fired, and I don't think he will. I don't think Trump will do that. Uh, but I think he is gonna be, I mean, I, I think he's gonna let the market suffer before he comes right to its rescue. So that's why I said earlier, I think the Fed put's still there. And if the market gets, gets crushed, he's gonna react. Oh, I think one of the things that he and his, his colleagues are doing is making it very clear that we are not gonna, you know, we, we're not there to bail you out at minus 10 or 20%. We've warned you repeatedly. Therefore, don't blame us. If you get, you know, if you're a, a low-risk investor and you're heavily exposed to stocks, and they go down 20%, don't. You know, we told you. You know, where are you looking in the markets? Obviously, you've got a lot of cash. So where are you looking for pockets of things that you can invest in for people at this late stage? We are already nibbling in some of the international areas. 
uh, particularly Asia, where many stocks are down 50%, and they're, they're great world-class companies. So we're already doing some buying there. Uh, the reason we're not being more aggressive is we feel like if the U.S. goes down 20, those will go down another 30. Yeah. But I do think when that happens, when there's truly a shakeout in the U.S., you're going to make the most money in places like emerging markets and maybe a few developed international markets. But in the U.S., I mean, we continue to like energy. It's lagged behind oil tremendously. We still like the gold miners, though they've been acting well lately. But, uh, you know, the reality is value in the U.S. is pretty scarce. We're certainly buying some Asian securities that have come down really hard and in some cases are selling at, you know, five and six times earnings. It's the carnage has been serious. Well, I mean, this is all, I mean, you can all trace all this back to the dollar. So, I mean, you know, I guess we have to talk about the dollar at some point because everybody has to have a view on it. What is your take on the dollar? Because there are two very distinct camps full on both sides of really smart people. Right. Uh, you know, I, don't, I, I think the dollar is probably a bit expensive. Uh, I think it's got a lot of, I mean, obviously the interest rate thing is the main propellant for it, the main ballast. But beyond that, we're going to have massive deficits to deal with. I think most foreign investors are kind of loaded to the gunnels with dollars. Do they really want more? Uh, the dollar is expensive, you know, on a purchasing power parity basis. So I would say, yeah, it's got some momentum, but I don't, I don't think it's an attractive currency particularly. I mean, there's been times in the past we've said that we thought the dollar was really cheap. This isn't one of them. In a crisis, I think I'd rather own yen, frankly. Really? The yen is cheap and it benefits when there's trouble. And I think the Japanese economy is in much better shape than it's been for years. I mean, they got a lot of debt, but at least they owe it to themselves. Yep. The Japanese market is really cheap, had a huge breakout. That's one of our favorite markets, actually. So again, we're not perma bears. We just like to buy things cheap. And I think Japan qualifies. The bullish theory on the dollar um, is essentially based around, I guess, a short squeeze and, and the need to pay back trillions of dollars of, of debt in dollars, the Fed's reducing the supply. So it feels to me like one big short squeeze is is the bull case, which I, I totally uh, there's, understand. There's certainly validity to that. Yeah, I totally understand that. Um, you know, I, I, I'm in the I'm in the, the other camp for the time being. I'm, I'm very prepared to change my mind. I've changed it a couple of times in the last three or four years. Um, but do you, do you, I mean, do you see that as a potential big problem, like, like the people in the dollar bull camp do, or do you think it's something like I do, that will get squashed. If it starts to become a problem, it'll get squashed pretty quickly. You know, I don't feel like an expert in this area, but I would say I think it's a big problem for certain countries. I don't think it's a big problem, you know, systemically. And I think if it becomes a big problem systemically, the Fed will, you know, reestablish some credit lines to ease, ease the squeeze. But, you know, you can argue the other side, which is just in the last fiscal year, the government borrowed, not deficit, but it actually borrowed 1.27 trillion. Mm -hmm. And you're going to have the Fed, and it'll be higher than that over the next fiscal year. And you have the Fed shrinking its balance sheet by 600 billion. So you're talking, talking like 200 or 2 trillion, excuse me, 2 trillion of additional supply, which is dollars. Uh, that's a lot. So, uh, you know, I don't think you can just look at that one aspect and say, well, gee, the dollar can only go up. But I can see that with the interest rate differential the way it is, it's kind of hard for it to go down a lot either. Well, what about Europe? I mean, this is something that people had kind of forgotten about Europe. It got, it got boring for a little while, but like Europe does, it never stays boring for long. Right. Uh, we've got the situation in Italy. We've Italy, got things sure. you know, really starting to bubble up again. And as I read the commentary this time around, it seems as though people have had so many potential Italian catastrophes that this is, ah, this will die down. Right. Getting up to it after a yeah, while. Yeah. I mean, do, do you think this, this time in Italy might be a bit more precarious? It seems to me it seems, instinctively it might be. I, I think so, only because it's part of a greater mosaic. There are so many things starting to go wrong simultaneously around the world. And unlike in the past, when you had the central banks just flooding it with money and kind of overwhelmed everything, you're going the other way. You get central bank tightening at the same time that all these things are happening. So yeah, I think it'll, it, there's gonna be something that is the trigger. Uh, and I think it'll be a, a you know, possibility, but it could be something totally, totally different. Like U.S. real estate, like you were saying earlier, there's kind of this blind spot uh, about how the, still the, the extreme importance of U.S. real estate. How do you insulate 
portfolios for the risks that you see? Because to your point, there, there seems to be troubles everywhere. How do you insulate a portfolio? Good for question. So I think for right now, it's, it's short, fairly short-term treasuries, short-term floating rate corporate debt, because corporate bonds are not always a safe haven. No. And once corporate spreads are very tight and they widen out, you can, get, you can lose a decent amount of money with corporate bonds. So you gotta be short-term, high quality, uh, but I do think in the relatively near future, there's going to be a great chance to extend duration with treasuries. So if we start to get rates up, and I think there's a decent chance we get close to 4% on the long treasuries, briefly, very briefly. That would likely be a real pain point, you know, globally and in the U.S. And that could trigger, uh, you know, stock market crash a la 1987. At that point, you want to go long duration with treasuries. And then at that point, you, you look around and see what has really been crushed. And, and that's where you would you know, put your money probably. I mean, obviously looking at fundamentals too. I do think it will be certain emerging markets, probably near, probably not gonna buy Turkey no matter how cheap it gets, but probably South Korea, Singapore. I mean, there's a lot of markets that could be very attractive. Well, you know, Tony Deaton said something to me that, that, that stuck in my head. He talked about the difference between being, being a contrarian and being in the minority, which, which he, it was just a passing comment from Tony, and as it all often happens when I'm talking to him, it, like a couple of days later, it pings back in my head and I start thinking about it a bit more. You know, are, are you a contrarian or are you in the minority? Because I think there is a, a, a subtle difference between well, the I two. guess the way we've said it is we're rational contrarians. Right. I mean, if you're just always contrarian, that's, that's probably not great. But I mean, people, I mean, people have made very successful careers out of deliberately being contrarian. I think the, the best way to do it that I found is to be, wait till there's really an extreme. And even better, I've learned the hard way, wait till that extreme starts to reverse. In other words, you know, it's whatever it is has been underperforming, underperforming, it's hated, but then it starts to outperform. I mean, gold could be a good, gold miners can be sure. an example here lately. So now you've got some momentum, but you've still got great valuation. But trying to catch all the little, you know, little squiggles along the way, uh, that's pretty tough. And you can end up writing something down a long way, which I've done. But, but that's, I mean, that's part of the territory. Right? That comes to your job, because you, you, if you're not trying to avoid those, you're trying to manage expectations of the people that think you should be, right? Right, and, and one of the things we do that, you know, I think investors, when they run their own money, they say, if I like something, I'm gonna put a lot into it. Yeah. When we see something that we think looks attractive, especially if something's in a downtrend, we'll typically nibble, go on pretty lightly so that we can dollar cost average. The reality, most people, they buy something, it goes down, oh, that was a mistake. Maybe I better get out and they end up selling close to the bottom. So if you go in with more of a discipline of, you know, I think, I mean, well, emerging market debt is a good example. So we recently, because it's been hammered, have bought a little bit of emerging market debt. But let's face it, if, they're, if the U.S. market's gonna go down 20%, emerging market debt's gonna get hit again. Sure. But if you go into it with the idea, I'm prepared to buy more, because I think there's great value long-term, you know, the volatility works in your favor instead of against you. So what should, what should people, I mean, people watching this that, that have 401ks or have money that's being actively managed, or even those that have money that they've put into passive funds, what questions should they be asking themselves right now? How should they be thinking about, I guess, stress testing their portfolios to, to your point about weakness, but what should people be thinking about right now? Well, I th definitely think that they should be thinking about downside, which they're not. You know, as Bob Schiller said just last week, the complacency is amazing. It's just pervasive and that's a very bad sign when the typical U.S. retail investor is very complacent. And I think that's how people feel about their 401ks. Oh, I'm doing great. If anything, they're looking at their bond funds and saying they're dogs and get out of those, and buy more stocks. And certainly they're selling their international to buy U.S. So I, I think anybody that's heavily exposed to the market right now needs to run at least a mental exercise of if the market falls 30%, can I handle it? How will I react? Will it change my lifestyle? Will it make me so nervous that I'll sell at an inopportune time? But you know, all those things that you've, you've, you've identified there, they're all exactly the things that people are doing. They're all, they're, I mean, you, you talk about how they're actually thinking, everyone's thinking the wrong thing. Uh, and you know, this, is, this conversation I really wanted to have because it's more from, from the perspective of trying to give people a sense of where they might be going wrong uh, and, and trying to give them a new way to think about this and, and some questions to ask first themselves before they ask 
the person managing the money, but you have to get that straight with yourself first and understand, okay, to your earlier point, what are my objectives now? Have they changed? Do, am I still managing for the same end goals? Because I think that was a great point you made. And that's not, not one I'd really spent a lot of time thinking about, but, but the, the goals you set when you were 35 with you know, two young kids are different to the goals you set when you're 50. And a lot of people don't make that an ongoing process. No, they don't. Um, you know, is, is, there a way, is there a way to do that? Is it purely you in the mirror? Is it something you have to do on your own? Well, first of all, I think very few people have the ability to effectively manage their own money. Very few people. Now, again, in a bull market, a lot of people think they do. Yeah. But it's the old Buffett. We'll see how many people are swimming naked when the tide goes out. I think there's going to be a lot of skinny dippers out there. I think firms like us, even though we're really focused on the investment management side, we're also very focused on the wealth management side. So we are going through right now with our clients an exhaustive review where we sit down with them and we go over there, you know, gather all their financial data uh, you know, and, and run scenarios of, you know, like if somebody is 60 years old and they have a certain amount of money and expectation of expenses, you know, let's look at what, let's assume that we get a very poor, kind of like the GMO thing, very poor long-term rates of return. Are you okay even with those assumptions? And if they are, well then, you know, you can rest pretty easy. Now, even in that case, we still suggest people be light on stocks right now because they're so expensive. But if somebody, you run that and you find out, wow, we're, we've really got a problem, and you find that they're heavily exposed to stocks, you better get them back really quickly, which is what I was mentioning with my friend. But then you get into the tax issue, and but I don't know, I think it's better to pay a little tax than get hammered with a, a bear but, market. But as you've gone through that process, because that must be uh, an interesting thing for you guys to go through as well, because things change and the markets move constantly. Have you found, have you been surprised by how many people do need to make adjustments to their portfolios? Yes, absolutely. We find that most people are, that are not our clients, are more heavily exposed to stocks than they should be. Yeah. And so, 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 I mean, so again, I'm, the whole point of this conversation was to, was to perhaps give people the incentive to at least think about this. You know, what I really wanted to get out of this was, was both sides thinking about it from the other point of view. And obviously the guys on your side, fellow money managers like you, you have to think of it from, from the customer side. That's really what, you, what your job is. But the customers, it's very rare that they sit down and think about this from the manager's point of view. It's, to your point, it's all about the bottom line. It's all about the numbers. Um, and so you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm keen to try and put that seed into people's minds that, you know what, I really do need to sit back, reassess this, and, and get back to what we spoke about at the very beginning of this conversation, which is that, that, that solid, robust dialogue, both ways, between manager and client, that used to be a byproduct of, of the commission system, right. and is now sorely lacking. I mean, right, it, I think that's very true. But, but is, is it just <clears throat> one phone call at a time? How, 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 do, how do we get, how do both sides kind of re-energize that dynamic? Because it seems to me to be very important. I think if you're, in your, if you're in our business, if you're a money manager, I'd really suggest that you do what we're doing, which is to go to each client and at least talk about their financial plan. Uh, I think it's a really good time to do it. I mean, it's, you don't want to wait until prices have been crushed because then it's very hard to reallocate. So now's a great time to go to your clients and say, you know, have you ever done a financial plan? You'll find out most of them haven't unless you've done it for them. Yeah. Now, maybe they've gone online and done some quick little thing, but, you know, it's not very good. And, and, and people love it. It's been the most popular thing we've done. I mean, this has been a firm-wide initiative for the last couple of years. And only recently have I really gotten involved in it. It's fun. And people, from our standpoint, clients often will say, you know, I've got this account out there that I really don't pay. Why don't we bring it in here and consolidate? So, I mean, they think there's a pro-business part of it, but the real reason you're doing it is to help the client make sure you're on the same page, that they really understand, you know, what a bear market could do to their financial situation. Because I, I do worry, as I said earlier, I think people, there are so many Americans, millions of Americans, that are gonna get into a hole in the next bear market that they'll never get out of because they need to take, keep taking out distributions. And if you have enough of a hit at the same time that you're taking out money, at some point it's just you know, point of no return. Yeah, it's, it's, um, 
it's, it's now is the time to kind of make these absolutely these these, these adjustments and, and, and do Before this. It's too late. Yeah, exactly right. Well, David, look, just as we're finishing talking, the sun's coming out. It's, it's a, been our personality. It's a beautiful right? day. Look, we finished. We chased the clouds. Well, we've, we've just left things on a sunny note. That's there all. We it's, go. It's, but look, look it's, it's, I can't thank you enough for this. I know you've been sick as a dog. I really appreciate you taking the time to do this, and, and hopefully. And this is a conversation I was I was really keen to have because I think there's so much important thinking for people to do, and hopefully uh, some of this is going to resonate and people are going to start thinking themselves. Yeah, maybe it's time to do a little little assessment before before things get any crazier. But again, so. thank you so much for your time as always. Thank you, Grant. It's always great talking to you. Over the years, David Hay has become a dear and trusted friend and someone whose counsel I've sought on many occasions. He has a level of experience and a perspective which is only achievable over time. And even as he struggled with his voice, David's words resonated as strongly as I'd hoped when I traveled to Bellevue to meet with him. The strength of the communication between manager and client is arguably the most important dynamic in the world of finance. So to see it at perhaps its weakest when it needs to be stronger than ever has continued to trouble me over the last several years and is something David and I have discussed at length in private many times. And as a day that began shrouded in fog reached its end, I felt as though, thanks to David, my own mind was much clearer about how the manager-client relationship had changed and, more importantly, how it needed to evolve in order to continue to serve its incredibly important purpose. <laughs>